This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings, or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Well, good morning. Let's get started here. We will uh, we'll have a word of prayer here, and we'll jump in with Exodus 11 and finish off last week's handout and jump into a new one. So, Lord, we thank you for the day you've given us. Thank you for your word. And as we look into it this morning, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to truth um, as we examine your word. Would your spirit work among us and open uh, for us and convict us sin and, and just, Lord, use the story here that we're going to look into and, and what you've recorded for us to prompt our hearts and how we should live and respond and act. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. All right. So last week we were working on the la Exodus 11. And if I'm not mistaken, we'll read the passage here, but I think we left off at page five in the handout. So here you go, Scott. You can all right, so we'll read uh, chapter 11 again just to get our minds back into what's going on here. This is the last of the ten plagues. And uh, so this, this plague gets the most attention for a couple reasons. It's the most significant, but it kind of spans from chapter 11 through chapter 13. Um, and chapter 12 is instructions for the Passover meal mixed in with the elements of the plague. So... Anyway, chapter 11 here, uh, what we'll cover, review and cover in this handout, uh, Exodus chapter 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards, he will let you go hence. And when he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people and let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor sil uh, jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, the from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maid servants that is a servant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was no, none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue, against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me, and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in great anger, in a great anger, excuse me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. All right, so we left off with page five um, in the handout. Uh, we'd kind of covered most of this, so we're kind of dealing with verses four to five of this chapter at this point. It, the, the extent of the damage here of who's going to suffer here will be everyone from royalty in Pharaoh's household to the, the, the specific example they use is someone who mills uh, behind the mill or whatever, a mill worker. I uh, started with into this last week, but they were, um, this was a job normally captives got. So if you were cap, you know, taking capture as a prisoner of war, this was a menial task they would give you to do 
kind of a degrading low form, you know, obviously low pay, uh, but it was, uh, they would be affected, so the rich would be affected, the poor would be affected, even the animals would be affected. Now, you think of if every firstborn is dying, human, animal, there's going to be a lot here that are going to suffer as a result, as well as on the human level, everyone in every family will have some relative who passes away. Everyone's is just going to impact everybody. Um, the question may get asked, um, and this this really comes from a modern context: Why would God cause children to die because of Pharaoh's rebellion? Because think about it: Was it necessarily uh, this firstborn child's fault, or was it the animal's fault? The, the problem with that question is it's not the question a biblical author would have asked. So it's just not in their framework and their thinking. Um, uh, this quote may help with that answer. Uh, it may convolute the waters more, but it says, The context is theological and liturgical, not moral and humanitarian. Deities were, and still are, offered the first fruits the first sheaf of corn from the field, the first lamb from the flock, the first bunch of grapes from the vineyard, the first libation of wine. All these were offered as sacrifices expressing gratitude and tribute. Egypt and her gods and her semi-divine pharaoh as they approached it. Morning, come on in. So, um, Egypt and their gods, the semi-divine pharaoh, were forced to offer first fruits, both human and animal. This sacrifice is now offered to Yahweh, for he alone is God. Egypt unwillingly sacrifices its firstborn to the God of the Hebrews. So, so I got the text from you this morning, that, what time, Sunday school? And it said Justin, but I couldn't process who that was. So... <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, glad to have you guys. Uh, we're actually wrapping up last week's lesson. If you guys want to share, I got two left. So if you want to share those, and then we'll start into another one because I didn't finish last week. Um, so anyway, it was common in ancient Near Eastern thinking and even the the Egyptian thinking. Firstborns were often. Oh, we're on page six, by the way. Firstborns were kind of five, six. We kind of crossed the page there. Uh, firstborns were given often as sacrifices to the gods. Okay, now, this is not Hebrew or Israelite thinking, um, although there is a lot of language of giving your firstborn a first fruit to God, but there's a grave distinction between giving your first fruits to Yahweh or to the God of the Bible and giving your first fruits to these foreign gods. The distinction was when you gave your first fruits to the God of the Bible, it wasn't human sacrifice. But it was not uncommon for you to take, like in worship of Molech and some of the other gods, for you to take your firstborn son to sacrifice it and bury it under your house or your business. And that burial of that baby was, it was a sacrifice and offering to the gods to make sure your business and your life went well. Do you see the contrast between the God of the Bible and the gods of the nations? In, the, in how they view life, in how they view the value of life. Um, and so, th as they're leaving Egypt here in Exodus 11, as they're preparing to go, as God's pronouncing this last plague on Egypt, he's doing it a way that the Israelites, it, they know what's going on, but the Egyptians also catch what's going on as well. Um, it's interesting, recently, or fairly recent, in the last 50 or so years, um, They've discovered some inscriptions on some tombs or uh, buried coffins that have some neat phrases on them. It's in that box there top, towards the top of page 6. Uh, a possible historical reminiscence of the event has been uncovered by, and I'm going to slaughter these names, so I'm just going to skip them. But some of these, they have uh, tests that, text on some of these coffins that say things like, the day of the slaying of the firstborn, or... Uh, another text, to the night of the slaying of the firstborn, um, or some other you know, things of that nature. Isn't it interesting? There's very little, but there, there are some things where even in Egyptian archaeology that they're discovering, they're, they're finding these remnant elements of, hey, there was something, some event that happened here. 
Now, why do you think the Egyptians don't give us any record of the plagues in their writings? There, there are a few mentions, but why do, you, why, don't we, why do you think we don't get much history on that from the Egyptian side? Okay, there's that element. It, it does validate the Bible, but there's even a... Um, there, there's more of a, a pride element to it. What's that? Okay, good. So, do you really like telling people how you got your hind end whooped? No, you want to tell them about your victories, right? The same is true if you, in, in, in ancient Near Eastern histories and how they write, okay? They're going to tell you about all their victories. They're not going to tell you about all their defeats, all right? Uh, and so it's not, it's been one of the critiques of the Bible. Well, you know, we don't have anything outside of the, the Bible to validate that this happened. It's like, really? You, you, you talk about this in relation to Babylon and Assyria and how when Assyrian whoops up on this nation, Assyria writes about it, but this nation doesn't say the same thing and, and vice versa. So we don't have to find these texts outside the Bible to prove the validity of the Bible, all right? But it is neat when we look into archaeology and we see some of this stuff, we see these hints and we're going, yeah, even they admitted at certain points stuff is going on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We, yeah, we don't we don't like to well, yes, we don't like to admit our weaknesses. Verse 6 here goes on. Um, there shall be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, such as there never was one like it, nor shall be like it anymore. So Egypt's going to mourn. It's kind of interesting. In the beginning of this chapter, you have the people of Egypt showing favor and, and to the Israelites because God gives them grace in their eyes. But at the same time, they're going to mourn and they're going to suffer. You have this phrase that comes up, uh, not a dog shall wag its head against them. Is that verse? Yeah, verse 7. Not, not a dog move his tongue. Okay, so it's an expression. It's idiomatic, but it's, it's basically saying nobody's going to say anything negative. A dog's not even going to bark at them because, yeah. So we just talked about last week, um, what verse was that Mm-hmm. That is something, it's, it's one of those questions we don't have an answer for. And, I, and I'm going to approach it from two, two angles. Israel was, it's called elect, they're God's chosen people, right? Were all Israelites saved automatically? No. Why? Because we know most of them apostatized. So just because you're God's chosen people, if you're not going to follow him, and if you're not going to believe what he says, it didn't make you automatically good to go. Which is why the prophets use terms like, we need a new heart, we need a circumcision of the heart. Which is why Paul uses phrases like, a new Israel or a true Israel is not simply a bloodline Israel. A true Israel is one who has the faith of Abraham. And he uses that language to tie us into Gentiles who are then grafted into the tree. Does that make so that's that's one element of what your question's asking. The other is we're getting the big picture story. Moses, when writing Exodus, is not concerned at this point of nuancing the difference and, and giving you us the footnote of okay, Egyptians who believed in the Lord did this and they were saved, and Israelites who didn't bother doing it weren't. He didn't tell us, so we don't know that there were or weren't. However, if you've just watched the Ten Plagues decimate Egypt, I'm thinking you would. Yeah. But you just can't come down and say either way. Right. So, and dogs were viewed, um, different cultures view them differently, but in Hebrew and Egyptian culture, they were viewed negatively. Like, this, this cultural perception, today we have dogs in our homes, we have cats, we have, you know, people love their dogs. Um, even, even, even President Trump has been commenting on, on he, uh, he said, you know, I, I'd love to have a dog, but 
I just don't have the time for it. But he understands Americans love their pets, all right? A dog is not something you would have for a pet in Egypt. A dog is not something an Israelite would have for a pet. Uh, that was viewed, looked down on. Even Jesus, when uh, the, oh, see, the woman, where was she from? Was she from, she was, she was not Israelite, and she came to him, and her expression was, or he, he said to her, is it good to take the meat for the children of Israel and to cast it to the dogs? And, and that's a view that the, the Jews would actually call people they didn't like dogs. It was a negative expression. Um, and her response was really, really good. It was, well, even the dogs could eat the crumbs from the, the table. And Christ comments on her faith. It's one of the two people, two or three, that Christ marvels at their faith. But anyway, all that to say we don't know for sure um, all the details of what did or didn't happen this expression of dogs here is, I almost wonder if it gets to the element of when you're, you're so exhausted on a situation and you don't know what to say, but you're not going to speak out anything for or against, you're just, you're just going to be a standby and watch. You, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if that's part of what they're getting here to or not, but verse four here, or, uh, not verse four, going on here, verse eight, and all these servants shall come down and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee, and I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. There's a bit of a contrast and reversal here going on. Who went in and bowed before Pharaoh early in this plague story? Moses and Aaron go bow and give respect to Pharaoh, right? Now who's bowing? The Egyptians are bowing down to Moses. Is it out of respect? Yeah, maybe, but more out of pleading, get out of here. <laughs> we, we, we're, we're done. There, it's a dog with its tail between its legs. All right, That's, that's what's going on here. Uh, so that's the beauty of so many of the biblical stories. If, if you read and pay attention, there's so many of these back and forth you know, reversals that take place. Um, he give, we give us this, oh, and the other thing I, I love about this verse, it happens a couple times in the story, and he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger, I mentioned this last week, his nose turned red, is the literal translation, a great anger, his nose turned red, <laughs> so it's a very pictorial, Moses was really upset and hot about how Pharaoh had responded, how Egypt had responded, and, and I like what um, Walter Kaiser says, he says, but the stu stupidity and waste of all those lives just because of the stubborn sinfulness made Moses exceedingly angry. To be in the presence of evil and not be angry is a dreadful spiritual and moral malady. Think about it. There's an expression that we have, evil triumphs when good men do nothing. Now, that's not a Bible phrase, but Moses here has been presenting to Pharaoh over and over, let the people children of Israel go. Let them depart. God wants his children to be free. And Pharaoh has resisted and resisted and resisted. Pharaoh has said, okay, you can go. And then he changes his mind. Uh, he's, I've used the expression probably too many times. He got his hand caught in the cookie jar. When he can't fix the plague himself, he wants relief. And as soon as relief comes, he's not truly repentant because he goes right back to what he's doing or wants to do. So this has not only incurred the wrath of the Lord, but Moses is angry now. And I think he's probably been angry through this story. And the plagues probably took a series of months for all these to unfold. But Moses is now angry. And I want to be careful how we talk about anger because anger is, is a, dangerous, a dangerous thing because it can lead us to do many wrong things. Uh, but evil should bother us. When people do things that are wrong, it should bother us. And that's because as we draw close to the Lord, as we draw nigh to him, the things that bother the heart of God will start to bother us. Uh, and so Moses here is, is, he's bothered by Pharaoh. I mean, he's seeing the results of Pharaoh and his staff, how they've rejected the word of the Lord, rejected what God says. He's seen how it's decimated even the innocent people of Egypt. 
Morning, come on in, Dory. The, the people of Egypt who had no control over Pharaoh's decisions, they suffered. They suffered through the darkness and the boils. and the, They suffered through all that. And it made even Moses angry. So that closes out Exodus 11. Any comments or questions there? What's this? Oh, my children are drawing Moses with a red nose.